Leo, thank you for reading that for us. And can I welcome you here, particularly if it's your first week here at St. Helens. And uh, please have that passage open, so page 1157. It was while I was preaching on 1 Corinthians 15 on this very passage that somebody first told me there was such a phrase as YOLO. They shouted it out during the sermon, which was a little bit rude, but very helpful overall. Um, The phrase YOLO, you only live once. You only live once, and therefore, live now for whatever you can get. It's actually a shocking bit of inflation, I think, on uh, the phrase that ran around when I was growing up. We used to say you're only young once. Okay, that was a bit more reasonable. That was kind of be wild until you're 25 and then settle down and be boring. And I think um, somebody, the baby boomers maybe, decided they didn't want to settle down at 25. So YOLO, you get your whole life as your last chance to be wild. Live now for whatever you can get. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we're in for three weeks is about resurrection. And last week we looked at Jesus's resurrection. And tonight we're looking at yours, your resurrection. And what this chapter is saying is that YOLO is not true. You do not only live once. In fact, YOLO is a lie. You live twice. It's not quite as nice. YOLT. It's not quite as, it doesn't sound so quite so good, but you live twice. So have a look at verse 58. We went there last week. We said this is the application of the chapter, the last verse. Something in this chapter means, therefore, verse 58, live differently. And the something is our resurrection, your resurrection. Because you live twice, therefore, verse 58, the work and the labor in the Lord is not in vain. You don't only live once, you do not have to snatch at everything this life offers you because you live twice and you can live with the labor and the effort involved in being a Christian. See, the question of why bother is pretty important in the Christian life. If you're not just gonna uh, kind of live a half-hearted, um, a little bit of Christian dusting on the top kind of life, why bother with the hard work and the cost? And Corinth, I think, is the church where they decided not to bother and just see what happened. And uh, the letter kind of comes a couple of years at least after they made that decision. And what happens is they argued, they divided, they ended up in court with each other. They got drunk in church, they slept with prostitutes after the service, and when they were out with their friends, there was no way to tell who the Christians were from the pagans, even when they went to the temple of Zeus. And if you were Paul, coming to the sort of climax of your letter, Wouldn't you give them just a massive telling off? You stinking, ungodly, pagan. Wouldn't you give them something like that? But because he is their pastor, not their judge, he goes after the real problem in this chapter. See, they have lost any reason to do anything Christian if it costs them. If it costs them effort or status or discomfort or face, or their freedom. And so when he gets to the climax of his letter, he tells them why to bother. You should bother because of the resurrection. You should bother particularly because of resurrection bodies. That's what we began working on last week. You see, Greek culture, their culture, was absolutely fine with life after death, as I think ours is. Uh, Everybody believes in life after death, but it is bodies for them that was the problem. Bodies are limited and disgusting and weak. They're not spiritual, that's what they thought. And after you die, your soul floats away, free. I think that's just like our culture. In heaven, you'll be some kind of floaty ghost and you'll sit on a cloud and you'll be spiritual forever. And that future, that future vision, has no power at all to challenge YOLO. Um, I don't think it matters at all whether or not you believe you're going to go and sit on a cloud because YOLO things, they're all about your body, all about giving your body what it can enjoy in this one chance it has on this world. So Paul has to prove, YOLT, Paul has to prove that you live twice, prove that you will have a body in the future 
and that YOLO is a lie. And uh, stage one of that was last week where he proved that Jesus really rose. And what he needs to do now is show that if Jesus really rose, you will too. So if you believe that Jesus came back with a body, Paul wants to show you that you will certainly have a body in the future. There's a handout that'll help you see where we are. We've got two reasons first and then an application. So first reason why you will definitely have a body in the future is because Jesus Christ was the first of many. And that is verses 20 to 23. Let me read from verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And uh, just be helpful, just skim across the next few verses and just see how much Paul emphasizes that Jesus was a human being. So uh, by a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam, who was the first man, so also in Christ. I think we tend to separate out. We think of Jesus dying as a very human thing to do, but of Jesus rising as a very godlike thing to do. That is not right at all. Resurrection was Jesus's human job. You need to take a human Jesus and then put in Paul's big main illustration here, and then you'll see why we must rise. So the illustration is first fruits. Verse 20, in fact, Christ has been raised, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. It's there again in verse 23. So that is a harvest time term. It's kind of harvest time now, which is exciting. If you're from my background, it means I get to go back to my childhood and see if my Somerset accent is still there. So um, I need you to imagine that Wurzel and Adge are um, there in the cider orchard, and it is harvest time, and they're getting ready to pick the apples. They say, um, are, uh, are they apples ripe yet, Wurzel? Um, and, uh, and they pick one. They pick one apple down, they slice it up, and they start chewing. And that apple, that apple is the first fruit. It's the, the test apple. We pick one, we, tie, we bite it to see whether we're ready. So, oh, and then kind of great Somerset sighs of satisfaction. Arr, kind of like that. Um, because it is time to hire the local lads and bring in the harvest. But now just imagine, um, imagine they have another mate with them, and uh, we're gonna call him Tarquin, because that's what farmers in Somerset are really called. And uh, Tarquin says, um, I, 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 I don't think there really is gonna be a harvest. You know, that apple, that was just a one-off. You don't seriously think you could come here tomorrow and make cider, do you? And uh, Wurzel and Edge, they do the sensible thing, and they drop him off the Seven Bridge, because he's an idiot. Um, first fruits guarantee what comes later. Jesus is the first fruits. He is part one of a harvest of, of human beings who are just like him. That's the point. Who God is going to raise from death, not as a, a second harvest, but as part of the same one. Jesus' resurrection is the taster, and it guarantees what comes afterwards. This apple says that all of the rest will be the same. Anybody with a real link to Jesus Christ, everyone who's in the same harvest, verse 18 says, fallen asleep in Christ. That's death for a Christian. Uh, verse 22, anyone in Christ shall be made alive. Verse 23, those who belong to him. And uh, the harvest image is appropriate because uh, we're in the Old Testament, I think, here. Paul has in mind Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 as he's writing. That's when we find out about Adam and about death. And I've put on the sheet um, a drawing that is a very famous way of mapping out Genesis 1 and 2. So uh, it may be familiar to you, but the crown there is meant to be God. It says God made everything. He made a world, that's the kind of round circle there, and he made a human being and put him on the world and over the world. So Adam was God's number two, ruling the world just underneath the crown. And then Genesis chapter three is about where death comes from. Death arrives because Adam did not want to be God's number two. He wanted to be God. Verse 21, by a man came death. And uh, since then, 
ugly, disgusting death has been tearing up this world. We all join in and we tear up each other until, verse 22, in Adam all die. So with Genesis 1 to 3 open, first fruits is about much more than just one new harvest. This is about one new creation, an entirely new creation. In fact, um, the language of heaven, I think, so much implies uh, floaty cloudness that even though it is biblical language, actually to say new creation is much better because creation is about apples and rocks and mountains and trees and stubbing your toe and being really alive. The, the God who made the whole universe, his plan is to do that again. That was always the Old Testament plan all the way through. And uh, the excitement here is he has started. The new creation has begun. The new heaven and the new earth, it actually already exists. It exists in Jesus. He is the first fruits. He is the display model. He's the show flat, so you know that it's real. So here is the the reason why Christian funerals should be different from other funerals. Um, Why actually, like last week, if you are a Christian, you really can see death as like falling asleep, like a kind of early night and a comfy lion. Because Christians who believe in Jesus are linked to him indestructibly, united by the Holy Spirit, and he is the new creation that has already begun. So just like it's impossible for this world not to be full of death, um, because we're all linked into it by Adam, it is also impossible that Christians will not rise, because we are linked into Jesus. Verse 22, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. That is not something uh, weird and doubtful and new in the future. It's something he has already done in Jesus. So for anybody here who struggles to believe in their future, well, go from where we were last week and build a bridge from Jesus' resurrection through to your own. So I believe in Jesus' resurrection. Build a bridge to mine that sometimes I struggle to believe in. If you can see Jesus standing with a a real physical body, well, then see yourself standing next to him. It's impossible that won't happen if he rose and you are linked into him. You say, uh, think what Jesus did after he died. You can uh, imagine him laughing and talking and you can reply to him. Remember how he walked between Jerusalem and Emmaus. So go for a walk if you want across new planet Earth. Do you remember he built a fire out of charcoal? Well, that means you should be able to look forward to doing things in the new creation. We don't know all the details, but throw sticks, make fires, climb trees. Remember how he made friends again with Peter, who had let him down and betrayed him. Remember how his friends said their hearts burned to see him again. And we don't know quite how it will all work, but you can fill that picture with loved ones who've died as Christians ongoing friendship with Christian parents and friends and children, they're in that picture as impossible that will not happen because Jesus rose. That's the first reason. He was the first of many. Second reason, verses 24 to 28, he is the future king of all. Future king of all. And uh, like the word man, the word all and the word every comes uh, repeatedly. It comes 10 times in these verses in the original language. This is a, a section about finishing the job. And the job to be finished is recreation. That's the job Jesus has set himself to recreate this world. But people still die and the world is still messed up. We're still not back to the picture on the sheet, but we will be. Verse 24. Verse 24, we will be. Then comes the end when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. So at the end, Jesus is going to put this picture back in place again. Jesus is going to destroy everything that is against God and he will plant himself ruling over the entire world again. So there will be, there will be a human being in charge over the world again, and his name will be Jesus. And then the kind of complicated verses in 27 and 28 uh, that are hard to make sense of, all that is doing is putting the crown back in the right place. Jesus, the man 
who is in charge of the entire world at that point, he is going to go down on one knee to God the Father, and the picture will be complete. God will be ruling over everything. Under him, there will be a human being perfectly ruling the entire universe. And actually, in that human being, in Jesus, every Christian who believes in him, in new bodies, with him, that will be recreation, perfectly done, job finished. And uh, with, again, a bit of Old Testament open, Paul heads off to two Old Testament Psalms. Verse 25 is Psalm 110, which talks about God's king ruling over everything and resting his feet on his enemies. That is pretty definitive, isn't it? When you've got to the stage where your enemies lie on the floor so you can put your feet on them. Well, Jesus risen and Jesus now ascended into heaven means that Jesus is the king that was promised in the Old Testament. There's no doubt who that is. The one who is going to rule over everything forever All he is doing now is waiting for his footstool, waiting for all the enemies to be under his feet. Uh, Verse 27 is Psalm 8, talks about first creation, about human beings standing, like in the picture, with all things under his feet. That's how it was meant to be, that's how it was for Adam, and how it has not been for anybody since Adam. I don't know, do you rule the world? Um, I can't even deal with clothes moths in my house, let alone rule the entire world. But Jesus is going to have everything under his feet. Do you see, we've done an entire Bible overview just there. I don't know if you're signed up for the Bible overview next year, but um, we've just done it in about five minutes, which will save you some time. Um, We've gone from first creation through the Messiah and the King all the way to the new creation. And I don't know if you can see how that helps us know that we will rise. Uh, One thing it does, like we said on Wednesday night, actually, if you were here, it really ups the stakes for God. Uh, Raising me is not just a nice favor that God does for me, uh, though I am pretty pleased about it. Raising us is the climax of God's entire plan for the entire universe. And he has not won until he raises us. Why is that? Well, if you think about all of those enemies that need to be crushed and defeated, and if you think this is all about redoing creation, so who is the number one enemy of God's created order? The answer is in verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. It is, uh, it's like redoing creation was uh, just one big computer game. And uh, Jesus, he marches through history, completing every single level in the computer game. And at the end of the game, there is always a boss, isn't there? And the boss in this terms is death. Uh, The final boss, the ruler of this world, the killer of every human being. While death still exists, Jesus is not king of the world. Uh, And what is it that would defeat that enemy? What would defeat death? What defeats death is Christians coming back to life again, out of his power, with bodies, really, truly, with indestructible bodies that he cannot touch this time. Another physical creation like the first one when death has been defeated with bodies like Jesus. So if you believe that Jesus rose, then you believe that he is the Christ, he's the king. And if you believe he's the king, then all, all, every, every, all should be your watchword. He's the future king over everything, including death, especially death. And when he is king of everything, death is going to be knocked out on the floor. And your resurrection is the knockout blow, like all of us out of our graves, one after another, as death goes down on the floor. Of course we'll rise. So, you do not only live once. YOLO is a lie. You live twice. If you think Jesus rose from the dead, if you think there's good evidence for that, then you have proved your own resurrection. As impossible it won't happen. You have two lives. Okay, well, in the time we've got left, I want to make this ruthlessly practical. So point three is about life in the shadow of death, verses 29 to 34. Because that is where the Corinthians have been living. That is the YOLO life, actually. I think it's where most of London lives, in the shadow of death. There's only one way to live if you know that you're going to die, and that is in verse 32. 
Uh, verse 32, uh, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Um, if you know you're going to die, if you live in the shadow of death, then you either despair or you cut loose and live as wild and as fast as you possibly can, because time is so short. When uh, A few years ago, I, um, I had a screensaver on my computer that I got from an ad campaign that KISS FM did. Uh, the campaign was called Live Sexy Before You Die. And uh, how it worked, there was a kind of clock that came on your computer if you downloaded it, and you end answered a few kind of intrusive questions, and then it told you how long you had left to live. And it, it ran backwards from that moment on in big red numbers, and it did it in uh, you know, years and months and days and hours and minutes and seconds and hundreds of seconds. And the, the numbers just span away while uh, stuff was going on. Do you get the point of the campaign? Live sexy before you die, because your life is spinning away while we sit here. Seconds are passing that you are never going to get back. Why are you here? Why are you not having sex was the point. Uh, or at very least, why are you not enjoying every last second of this life? They had a series of slogans that went with it. They said, um, Kiss FM said, they said, party, dance a little, be kind, be calm, be sexy, listen to Kiss FM. You know, I'm not, um, I am not know if, don't know if it entirely worked for them as a slogan, but um, do, you, do you see how degrading and corrupting death is? Do you see how degrading it is to have a clock on your shoulder? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And that, that is why the Corinthians have such messed up morals. That's why verse 34 has to be there, wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. The, uh, the logic in this chapter is that what you believe exerts peer pressure on how you live. And uh, that's there in verse 33, I think. Verse 33 is a quote from the sort of top uh, film of Paul's Day equivalent, uh, saying everybody knows there's a connection between who you hang around with and the kind of morals you end up with. Uh, don't be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. But Paul's point is it's not just about the friends you have, it's about the ideas you have in your brain. Uh, if you hang around on street corners with beliefs like Christians don't come back with bodies, you only live once, well then your morals are gone and you won't be able to fight temptation. And uh, the rest of the letter spells that out. I said they were in a mess. Uh, one good place to go to see this would be chapters five to seven. So we're not gonna turn to them really, but chapters five to seven, they're all about their sex lives. And I think it's really helpful to see how much of a mess a church could get itself in. Chapter five, they have a very public case of incest that the church is not sure whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. Chapter six, uh, it looks like there's a kind of post-church social going on where you, you kind of head down to the prostitutes afterwards. Chapter seven, you have uh, married couples trying to avoid sex to make them holier and single people thinking that they failed at being Christians because they're not married. And that's all kind of stirred in in one place all at one time. And I think that is very, very helpful that the church in Corinth was in such a mess and Paul wrote it down and we've still got it in God's kindness. I've uh, been here 14 years at St. Helens, and if you work for a church, then some people tell you some of what is going on in their lives. And uh, over 14 years, it's astonishing the things that people have told me. Our culture is highly, highly sexualized, and porn normalizes any amount of destructive behavior from a very, very young age. And uh, I've learned that it doesn't matter how long someone's been a Christian, doesn't matter how sorted they seem. Uh, you could be you know, the senior Bible study leader, you could be the CE president, you could be a brand new Christian. Um, is this life your body's only chance to eat and drink? Your body's only chance to have sex, to do whatever it is your body wants to do. Uh, if YOLT is true instead, if you live twice, then the effort and the denial, that the daily death, of living for Jesus is not a waste, is not in vain. And it may be in our culture that in the era of sex that is particularly difficult. In this room we will all be sexual 
Sinners, Jesus says, whoever looks at a woman with lust in his eyes is as if he has slept with her. So we're all sexual sinners. And some people in this room will have sexual pasts that they are deeply ashamed of, and others will have present addictions that they have never told anybody about. Um, are we as a group going to be too English to help each other on that kind of thing? And if somebody talked to us about that, would we know what to say? Well, how about saying that YOLO is a lie? The things your body thinks this is their last ever chance, that is a lie. And if sex isn't the area where you particularly find this difficult, well, write down chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. And you might want to look that up at home and see, uh, once he's done talking about sex, he goes on to greed and drunkenness and slander and a whole bunch of other things. See if any of those fit instead. They're all about giving me and this body the kick and the buzz and the things I want now. And why do they have such a problem? They have that problem because bad company ruins good morals. And it, it's interesting, I think, that the, uh, the 21st century church says it believes in the resurrection. I think we, we take the box on this quite comfortably. We believe in the resurrection, but very few of us talk about our new bodies. Uh, we talk about heaven, not a new creation. We imagine floaty ghosts and uh, clouds and all the rest of it. I think it's no wonder that 21st century Christians have all the same problems as Corinth. And no one's ever going to believe, well, 1 Corinthians 7, are they? Unless they know their body has a future. Chapter 7 says it'd be better not to marry, uh, better not to have sex. Stay single until you die. Never have sex. In our culture, that, you're barely alive unless you're having sex. Why would you do that? Well, you don't do that unless you believe that you will be raised in the new world with a new body for eternity. And all the way through 1 Corinthians, this would apply, this would help them. They are the eat, drink, and be merry church. We've got a few minutes left, so I want to go one step further than that still. Because as well as their morals, these verses also talk about their death. So verses 29 to 32 ask particularly, specifically, about death. So verse 30, let's pick it up there. Paul says, why am I in danger every hour. Or verse 31, I die every day. Verse 32, what do I gain if, humanly speaking, for merely human reasons, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus? See, if YOLO is true, then you will try and avoid death at all costs. That is the end. That is the worst thing that could happen. That is the unimaginable. But if YOLT is true, you are free of that terror. Uh, so fix the, um, the animal image in your head from verse 32. Uh, you have a, uh, well, maybe if you saw Gladiator, you can imagine Russell Crowe in the arena with the wild beasts, all kind of muscle and sweat and anger and fighting the tigers. Um, but then just take Russell Crowe out of the picture and put in Paul. So Paul tells us elsewhere that he is an unimpressive man in bad physical health. And he is now on his own in the middle of the arena. He's not Russell Crowe. He is good at theology and at writing letters. Okay, at this point, he hasn't yet written Romans. So, um, you know, half the Bible study at St. Helens are about to be lunch. And that, Paul says, is his ministry. Uh, we don't actually know if he's talking literally about the wild animals or if it's just an illustration. Um, why on earth would he bother, for merely human reasons if there was not another body for him after death. If there's no resurrection, well, then stuff suffering for the gospel. Stuff all of Christian morals and just get on with eating and drinking and, and getting ready to die tomorrow. And uh, that choice, will I die for Jesus or not, that is a literal choice for Christians all around the world. Um, I, a few years ago, I shared a room on a, a conference for student workers uh, with a student worker from Nigeria. And uh, he was from a Muslim part of Nigeria where churches are, at the time, they were being regularly suicide bombed, where, you know, rather than just shall I leave the park now and come to church Sunday evening, they'd be thinking, you know, there is a risk I'll die tonight if I come to church. And uh, he, um, while we were showing a room, he got an email come in about a bombing and about uh, friends of his that had been killed. And for him, that was just a normal part of being a Christian in the part of the world he was in. And uh, I remember hearing another 
a guy from, from there, a bishop from that town, saying, pray for us. And I, I remember thinking, wow, yes, we should pray. We should pray that this horrible persecution stops. And he said uh, next, he said, please don't pray that the persecution would stop. Pray that we would be faithful to Jesus. So there's somebody who understands that his death would not be in vain. He could avoid that death by just moving house, moving town, going back to where his family is from. But he is in the Muslim area of that country for a purpose, and maybe he will die. But he has a second body waiting for him. And here's my worry. I worry if we ever face that sort of persecution here in this country, what we would pray. Because I think I don't believe in the resurrection very deeply. And maybe I would just pray, make it stop. Maybe I would do anything to make it stop, including not being faithful to Jesus. Well, let me give you one other story that helped me think about this. There's a famous story of some missionaries uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the jungle in South America. Um, the book, uh, one of them's written by Jim Elliott, one by his wife. And it's a really stirring story kind of stuff. There were four guys, four young guys with uh, glittering career prospects who uh, threw it in to go and teach the gospel to one particular unreached tribe uh, in the jungle of South America, the Alka tribe. And uh, reaching the Alkas, there were, there were two problems to that. Uh, one was that they were very, very remote. And so they got around that by learning to fly. So they flew little planes and they landed them on beaches so they could go and meet them. The other problem, the second problem, was that they were very, very violent. And uh, they got around that, well actually they didn't get around that problem. The, the very first time they actually got out of their plane to meet them, after a long time of dropping messages and presents, uh, they were all ha hacked to death and died. Uh, but, amazingly, by God's spirit, their widows and their young children went back to the jungle to meet the people who had killed their husbands and told them the gospel. And they became Christians, and lots and lots of them were converted. And uh, Jim Elliot, that guy, he wrote very famous words that sum up this passage, I think, quite well. He wrote, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Wrote that in his diary shortly before he died. See, there is an understanding that you live twice. There is a second life. Now, I read that book. I read that book sitting in London, and books like that, they always um, they make me weep, and I think, I'll go, I'll go, tell me where, show me the spears, I'll go. Um, but in the, the very final chapter, there was a, a statistic. Um, the total number of Alka speakers was something like two or 300 people. That's the entire tribe. So 200 people. It doesn't change the heroism of it at all, does it? So God wanted to call those 200 people, and he decided to send 10 of his finest servants to go and reach them, those families. Um, it brings me up short, because I just started counting to 200. So I don't know if you could do this game as well. My house is number 73 of a street with about 90 houses on the street, and quite a lot of those are split into flats. So I reckon that is 200 people, just like that. Uh, and actually, on the other side of my street, not included in the numbers, is a little housing estate, quite a low-rise housing estate. There's got to be at least 200 people there as well. So I have the equivalent of two entire tribes living on my street. And broadly speaking, I do nothing about that at all. See, I hope I would die in a jungle faced with that choice, but die every day is actually harder. So a um, suggestion would be, why not try and split your friends, your uh, college friends maybe, maybe people you work with, your family, split them up into units of 200. And then just think whether you believe this chapter. Would it be worth the death, uh, the murder of five Christians, to reach them with the gospel? Let's pick five. Should we have, you know, you, 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 and you, okay? So would it be worth uh, that you didn't even know I was pointing at you. Would it be worth the murder of five Christians to reach them with the gospel? And if it would, what is it that prevents me committing everything up to and including that point to reach my friends with the gospel? And uh, my experience has been if you start in tiny, tiny ways. A few years ago, looking at this chapter, I decided to risk that with my family and my old school friends. 
and I, I decided if I was going to, if they were going to kind of back away because I did, I would risk it. And uh, there've been, I think, very, very minor costs to that. My family used to tell me stories about the family lunatic, and they don't do that anymore. Um, and I know why that is. Um, that's me now. That's my role. Um, and I think I remember with one of my friends, um, I had to go into another room halfway through a conversation. I think if I push again a bit now, he might not be my friend anymore. And he became a Christian. And that is worth it. So we live not YOLO, not we live once, we live twice. Our resurrection is certain, nothing is wasted, Jesus is our king, and to die every day is not in vain. Let me lead us in prayer. Dear Father God, thank you for raising the Lord Jesus from death. Thank you that there is an indestructible man at the, the heart of the universe. Thank you that your plan for the future is to give us all bodies like the Lord Jesus, that we are in him and that that cannot not happen. And Father, pray that as we live out our lives here on this world, for however long we each have, pray that we would live as if we could die every day and that would not be a waste because we live twice with you for eternity in your new creation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.